Good morning, Beville. This is Cindy Clark from PACB TV. And I'm here on a Zoom call this morning with a Roosevelt Bowie basketball player extraordinaire uh, from SU and with uh, Mayor Dick Clark, who uh, was a former sports writer with a newspaper and is very versed in basketball and knows all the right questions to ask. So that being said, I'll let the mayor take over and get this interview going. Well, it's, I'm very, uh, very pleased and excited to have a chance to talk to Roosevelt. Uh, I mean, I've been a Syracuse basketball fan from before Dave Bing. Uh, I remember watching Jim Brown play when I was about eight years old and uh, he and uh, Vinnie Cohen, we, I'm sure you've probably heard of Vinnie and uh, Gary Clark and the fact that Gary Clark was on the team. And I, even though he didn't have an E on the end, like we do, uh, it was Clark. So I was all excited. And so my father took us down to the war memorial to watch Jim Brown. And, you know, here was Jim Brown it was like bigger than life playing basketball. It was pretty cool. So I've, uh, I uh, worked at the sports department for 25 years at the Herald Journal, and uh, that's enough about me. Now we'll talk about you. You're, as far as we know, your career, your life started in Kendall, New York. Tell us a little bit about your high school days and, and what it was like growing up in Kendall. Well, it actually was pretty, uh, I was pretty fortunate. Um, at the age of, I actually went to school in Holly, New York from High, from kindergarten until uh, the age of 13. And at that point, uh, our, um, we were renting and the house was for sale. And at that time, it wasn't good for us. So uh, we moved back to Kendall, we moved to Kendall. I actually lived in Kendall when I was like two years old, until I was two years old. So we moved back to Kendall. I hadn't played any sports in Holly at the time. I get to Kendall. And what uh, normally that, that move is kind of traumatic for most people, but not for me because I had like 15 cousins that went to school in Kendall. Uh -huh. I only got to see once, that I only got to see once, once a year, if that. So when I came to, uh, when I came to Kendall, it was like a big family reunion and uh, it, it, it was fantastic. Um, came to this, uh, the new, the school had just opened a new school. So I walked in and, the high school basketball coach was standing right there because I walked in at about uh, about six three, six four and a half, and my my cousin who at the time was the star of the team who was six four, and here is a 13, 13 year old walking in the gym, walking in the school. He was like, I, I was probably six six, and uh, his brother his brother was six four then. So the varsity basketball coach met me to walk to the school, Coach Dick Reynolds, and uh, from that point on, it was just. It was uh, sunshine and it was a beautiful thing. So, so now you start to uh, eventually start to attract some colleges and uh, get recruited as late in high school, I'm guessing. And, uh, you know, it's funny because big people get recognized first. I mean, when you're a basketball coach and you see the big guy out there, everybody wants to know who that is before they check on the point guard and stuff. But so I'm sure people were talking about the big kid from Kendall and uh, so you end up choosing Syracuse, but, but it, it seemed like at the time, as I remember Bob Snyder telling me, if, uh, if Beheim didn't get the job, Rosie, might, Rosie and Louie might not have come to Syracuse. Uh, that, that kind of tipped the scale. Is, is that well, true or? Well, so, so what, so um, I forgot to add. So when I came to, before I got to Kendall, my cousin Nathaniel was here and he was a phenomenal athlete um, and he was supposed to be the, you know, and they thought they had a, uh, he was a, I think we were like a seventh grade or something like that. And he was already a, a great athlete. So when everybody saw, they thought that Kendall's going to be really, really good in the future. And then I walked through the door and they're like, oh my God, Kendall's going to be really good in the future. <laughs> so, Fast forward, uh, fast forward, he's 6'6 six, six with a, about a 38, 40 inch vertical. And I'm six, man, I was actually 6'11 and three quarters barefoot. And nobody <laughs> plays barefoot thanks to Nike. I'm over seven foot. <laughs> uh, and uh, I didn't have that. I only had a probably 36, 38 inch vertical, but I, had a, I have a seven foot, six inch wingspan. So you got these two kids at a school. Uh, we went on to, uh, uh, we actually won three sectional championships together. And 
we were, our record was uh, 65 and one. I remember we lost one game my sophomore year. Uh, game started out, we missed a shot. I went up to the tip end, came down on the kid's foot, twisted my ankle. I, so I was playing, I was only playing on uh, on one wheel. So only, I, had, I had 19 and 17, so I had a, a, a subpar, <laughs> subpar <laughs> game. We ended up losing by three points. And I made a point to come back and we played them the second part of the season. I was fortunate because after the game, I took my shoe off. My ankle was like 17 inches around. But it was Christmas break. So I had two and a half weeks to recuperate, come back in the new year. We beat that team by 25 points and let everybody know that it was a flu. Um, and then going into my senior year, I think it was the last uh, couple of games. I remember getting a, 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 I think it's called a telex from Dick Vitale and he was coaching at uh, Detroit, I believe. And he said, uh, this is for your 44 wins in a row. So we we're, 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 were actually, we actually won 43 games in a row going for the 44th game that night. And he sent me to Telex and funny now to think about it, the four, our 44th win in a row. I think I was destined to go to Syracuse. That's right. That's right. That 44 always seems to come up. Yes. So, so when, so then, um, I, I never visited Syracuse. So, uh, I started playing when I was 14, so I didn't really know much about basketball, but I love to play out. My cousins were all playing and, and I got really involved in the sport and I started growing with it. So by the, so I'm, I'm thinking that we went to basketball camp, uh, Jim behind basketball camp, then moving forward, I visited Georgia tech, Duke, Michigan state, um, Georgia Tech, Duke, Michigan State, Oklahoma State. I went to a school out in California in St. Bonaventure. And after I made my last trip, because you could you could leave on Friday and you had to come back, you had to come back on Sunday night before school. So never visited Syracuse University, but I went to basketball camp there. And Coach Beheim, the assistant coach, ran basketball camp. So I got to know Coach Beheim and see him there, but he wasn't the head coach. So I went to St. Bonaventure where uh, I had a great time. Um, it was, uh, I'm trying to think that, um, oh, I'm having, I'm having a blank right now. He'll, he'll smack me if he sees me. Uh, uh, the head coach of St. Bonaventure, who is now the voice of the Orange. Um, oh, Jimmy Sadlin. Jimmy Sadlin. <laughs> it was, it was so, it was so funny because I looked at the two teams and they were both pretty, pretty equally they had, they had experienced players in all the positions except at the center. They didn't have, neither team had a center. So since my mother didn't raise a fool, I was looking for a team that didn't have a center because I wanted to play right away. And so as it boiled down to it, I'm like, so I come back from California. I'm like, man, this is, this is really tough. I, uh, only thing I'm waiting to do is go back home. I better look at, start looking at schools closer to home. I went to Duke. I remember going down on the Duke campus. They had like, girls in bathing suits on the, in the quad, on the quad. And I was like, I said to myself, uh, I can't go to school here. I'll flunk out in the first <laughs> two weeks. <laughs> I got to go someplace where there's no, I got to go someplace where there's no distractions. <laughs> so I just so ended up going to, so I, I'm thinking about Syracuse. I talked to my coach, my, my high school coach, uh, Dick Reynolds, and he, um, uh, who, who uh, at Kendall, he actually won five sexual championships in a row. This is before the States. And I'm, and he's just taking me and we're just talking. He's not pointing me anywhere. We're just talking about things. So I come to school one day and he's standing and I, you know, I really like coach Beheim, but he's not the head coach. Uh, and Jimmy Sadler is the head coach. And, you know, so we're just, we're talking back and forth. And then uh, I think it was on a Wednesday, I come to school and coach Reynolds is at the door again. And he's holding up the newspaper it says, uh, Jim Beheim, new head coach of Syracuse university. And at that point, uh, my excuse to him the day before was, I like Syracuse, but Coach Beheim's not the head coach. So we walked straight through the school, got on the phone, called Coach Beheim on Thursday. He came out and I signed. So it made me look like a uh, virtual genius, but uh, in actuality, it was uh, a blessing. Wow. So, the, so in other words, Bob Snyder didn't steer me wrong in telling me that, that uh, Beheim had a no. lot to do with it. <laughs> You know, and actually, it's funny you should say that because I was out golfing with uh, Jimmy Lee and uh, one of his buddies. Um, I'm, I'm just having blanks all day today, but uh, 
And, and he said, you know, uh, I was at the meeting when Coach Beheim came in there. He said he just walked in there and he said they were going to open it up to a national uh, uh, search. And so Coach Beheim walked in and he said, um, you need to make me the head coach of Syracuse University today. If you do, I'll bring you Roosevelt Bowie and Lewis Orr. If you don't, I'm going to leave here and accept a job at the University of Rochester and take them there. <laughs> that, I heard that and he story. Said, and he said... And he said, he said, it, it, it's a true, he said, it's not a story because I was sitting there. I was, I was in the meeting. He said, I sat there and he walked right in there and he said that and everybody went. And at the time I was the number one player, small schools in New York state had been for the past two years, which I didn't know anything about because we didn't keep stats like that. We're just, uh, we're just kids out there having fun. And I guess that made a pretty strong and, and Syracuse didn't have a center. So, uh, Shortly thereafter, he came, we signed. I, and I, I didn't meet Lewis until uh, before practice. We came to, we're sitting there. So we go into the locker room and all the good seats are taken around the locker room because that's the you know, upperclassmen. And there's Lewis Orr and I sitting. He walked into the locker room. In the left-hand corner, there were two lockers. And Lewis took the first one. I took the second one. And we sat there. And that, those were our lockers for the next four years. And it's amazing how the center of attention shifted from all those other lockers to that little <laughs> corner, the little left-hand corner. And, um, and I used to, it was it's so funny because I used to every, every, every day I'm there tying my sneakers up and I'd look up and there'd, and there'd be uh, either Ron Payton or uh, Red Bruin. And they're standing there and they got their arms around one of us and they look at me and they go, Rosie, you know, one of us is going to dunk on you today. And I would just finish tying my shoes up and I'd look up and I said, oh, you mean one of you are going to the hospital today? <laughs> they said, and they, was, they said, oh, that's wrong. I said, no, what's wrong is you telling me you're going to dunk on me. You should have did it. And then came over and said something to it. So right now, you just put a target on your back. So we had a lot of, lot of fun there before, before practice. I'll bet. Talk, talk a little bit uh, for a moment on your relationship with Lewis. Uh, you know, one of the great pictures of all time was on the front of the press guide one year of the two of you running down the court, almost stride at the same stride. And it was like, you know, everybody had associated the two of you for four years. And I mean, you want to, you want a hundred and hundred wins and 18 losses in four years. Not too bad. Yes. So it's not too bad for, for a couple of, for a couple of kids from small towns there. You know, the, the funny thing about that, uh, that picture was the, the picture is actually taken with a zoom lens from the opposite end of the court. So Lewis actually started a fast break. I was about 15, 20 feet behind him. And there were, there were two series of that picture. And one series of that picture, I was on the opposite side of him. And he, he was dribbling the ball up and he looked over. And he, with his opposite hand, he pointed that he wanted me to go to the other side. And so the next snap of that picture, I was on the other side. And that's when they caught us in the same, in the same stride. We're in the exact same stride. He's dribbling the ball. And then the Daily Orange, I wish I would have kept it, but in the Daily Orange, the, 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 the local, the, the, the circus paper, it had, someone had taken that picture and drew a caricature of Lewis and I with, with suit coats, top hats, and canes. And we were dancing across the floor and they call us the Louie and Bowie Show. And that's, <laughs> yeah. and that's, that, that's how it stuck. But that was like, that was a very popular, very popular picture back then. And just to think, I was actually 15 feet behind him uh, I was actually running the trailer. So I was running behind him while he was dribbling the ball. In the first pitch, you can see him look over his shoulder and then you see him point. You see, like I was coming up the wrong side. So he pointed down the side he wanted me to come. So I just trailed it. I just trailed the play down. I moved over. And as soon as I crossed over behind him, they clicked the picture and it's uh, the rest is history. But you two guys were great buddies. I'll tell you what, we were good friends. We, so we, we met that day at practice. And we had a, um, after they retired our uniforms, they, they did an interview with us and we were just sitting on the stage talking. And, and Lewis said, he says, you know what? I was just thinking, we have never had a crossword in our entire lives about anything. Hmm. From the day we met, we were all on, both on the same page. And anytime we came together, if something happened, it wasn't, there was no your fault, my fault. It was like, what can I do to help it not happen again? How can I help? That was our the mentality that we did. So, so Coach, Coach Beheim, it was something he said when we first came in there. He said, when, uh, when something happens on the court, he 
He said, first thing I need y'all to learn how to do is put your hand up and say, my fault. Because if you're pointing the finger, nobody knows who the problem is. If you all put your hand up, you got five people trying to find a solution to a problem. And that's just kind of what we adopted. And uh, we never, ever had a crossword under. And it was so funny when he said that. It was darn near 50 years later. And I thought about it. I was like, never, we never had any reason to. So at that point, we were we, we were good friends. Then the accent, a lot of people don't know, but Lewis actually came over and played with me for four months in Italy. We played on the same team, Reggio Emilia in uh, Rio Nidi. And um, as, soon as, as soon as he got there, I was averaging about 16 points and 12 rebounds a game. And as soon as Lewis got there, it bumped up, uh, it bumped up my, I bumped my scoring up five points because Anytime he got the fast, got the ball and pushed it out on the fast. At this time, Lewis is he's six nine, great rebounder, playing in the NBA for years, and he had a strong his skills level was really high. So whenever he got the long rebound, he pushed the ball up the floor. Everybody would chase him, and he would just like either throw it over his shoulder or bounce it between his legs because he always knew I was following. And there were there was never a time in my life where it was like bowling. I would go, I'd go to the basket. Everybody would chase him. He'd throw it back to me, and I would go up and dunk it, and I would knock down three guys from the other team and two guys from our team. I was just, <laughs> I, I was just so, I was just so excited to have my. I knew I could almost, I could, I could hear what he was thinking, and he always knew where I was well, or where I was at all times on the floor. We played those four months together. It was absolutely fantastic. We had a great time, and then, uh, yeah, that that was that was a highlight. We we spent. Every from the time he got up in the morning until the time he went to bed at night, every day for four months we spent time together. Just just reaffirming the fact that you know the, the stuff that we did. You know, back then it was kind of tough. We couldn't really go out places together because then they would recognize us. But if we went out places separately, you know, we could go out and people would see us and be like, well, maybe that's because. I always wore a hat and I wore glasses and on the court. I had the big fro and I had contacts and Lewis, Lewis always had on like 14 layers of clothing because he always, he was always cold. Time they got a chance to, to figure out who, who, who we were separately, uh, you know, we're, we're getting ready to leave. But if we went out together, uh, we would, and Syracuse fans are the greatest, but we had, we had, uh, we couldn't have any time together until we finally got to Europe. And we spent every waking hour together, and it was it was fantastic. We're we're great teammates. We're great friends, and we just solidified that by spending that time together. Uh, that's great. Um, I I won't go too much longer. I think everybody knows your S, SU accomplishments. I, my highlight for for your career was the game at Purdue, and uh, you blocked a shot by Joe Barry Carroll late in the game. And uh, Eddie Moss had a great game, as I believe, if I remember right. But I just remember you, you going up and like pinning it to the board and, or swatting it away. And, uh, you know, he ended up being number one draft pick. But still, that day, our number one guy beat their number one guy. And so that was that was my highlight. And I, I wanted to share that with you. But um, just quickly, I guess, why did you choose Italy over the NBA? I don't know if I've ever seen that. You, what, if you've ever been asked that, I'm sure you have. But. I don't remember. Well, I just want to give you a quick, uh, the things that I remember about that game were Eddie Moss, we're down by like 10 points. Ed Moss, Ed Moss goes to take the ball out. We're down by like eight or 10 points. And they had a senior guard and the guy, and the guy, so my man's coming to set a pick and the guy goes, no, no, I don't need a, I don't need a pick this, against this freshman. And Eddie took that personally and Eddie, Eddie's, Eddie picked him three times, tipped the fourth one. Next thing I know, we, we win the game. So Ed Moss had a phenomenal, phenomenal defensive game. It was because this guy referred to him as a freshman. When Eddie walked through the door, he said, hey, listen, I don't believe in that freshman stuff. We're all men here. And when that guy said that to him, I went, ooh, it's on now. So, <laughs> so fast forward. So, so that, that was the one thing that stuck. And the other thing was everybody before we left, they said, we remember I had the big afro. We put our hands in, and coach said, "Okay, let's get out of here." And, said, no. and then Ed Moss said, "Come back." He goes, "And if we win, Rosie gets his haircut." So that's why I got my haircut my senior year. Oh, ah, okay. Which, which increased my point, my my points in those games. And I found out because 
the man playing me can no longer find me real easy. All right, yeah. tell where I was on the floor. So, yeah, where's where's the seven so, foot guy? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So they're looking around for me, and I'm and I'm like buzzing around this. So that that helped out a lot. But to answer your question, I was uh, I was drafted by Dallas, and it was their their first year in the league. So my thing it was the thinking of a seven of a of a of a twenty two year old. I said, in high school we're sixty five and one, at Kendall. I mean, at uh, at Syracuse, we're 100 wins, 18 losses. I hadn't I hadn't lost 20 games in almost a decade. If I go to an expansion team, I'm going to lose a lot of games. I didn't. I I wasn't really down with that. I w- I wanted to go to a team that was, you know, that really wanted me. So when I met Norm Sanju, he was a Jet GM. I went up, met him in the Adirondacks. He was talking about, yeah, you know, you can do this thing. You're a pretty good scorer, great defensive player. You do all this good rebounder. And, and he said, well, I said, well, I'm looking, you know, what kind of contract we're we talking about? He's like, well, we want to get you into camp. And I said, well, you know, and he said something next that, that totally changed my mind. And it was he. Uh, so I said, well, you know, I might, you know, I might go to I might, I might go to Italy. You know, I'm a kid. I don't know. I, I said, I might go to Italy. He goes, well, he says, no, I, I know it's always been your life. Uh, it's always been your your goal to play in the NBA. It, uh, it's, it's always been your dream to play in the NBA. And at that point, I didn't say anything, but I was looking right at him. And that's when I decided I was going to Europe because my life was in the hands of a man that knew absolutely nothing about me. It had never been my dream to play in the NBA. It was my dream to be a successful businessman. And I wanted, that's what I wanted to do. And it, it, it from times where you three-piece suit, put your, get, grab your briefcase, kiss your wife, go out the door and go to work. That's what I wanted to do. That was my dream. In my head, it had always been. Basketball just happened because I fell in love with it and it was a means to get to the next place. And that guy looked right, he looked right at me and said, well, I know it's always been your dream to play in the NBA. In my mind, something went, ding, this man doesn't know anything about me. And at that point, there were, um, I played in Italy with Syracuse University my sophomore year. And I got the, and I made the all tournament team in two, in two tournaments. And I made uh, MVP of the last tournament. And I was 19 years old and I was 195 pounds, seven feet tall. So when I graduated, I was 235 pounds. And they said, what the heck? He was awesome when he was 195 pounds. He must be a monster now. And they sent this guy over to get me. And he stayed in the States all summer. And he called me like every two weeks. And I just waited a couple of weeks and he kept offering me more money. And I was like, okay. Uh, after a couple of weeks, I said, okay, let me, let, me, let me add this up here. These guys really, really want me. They're willing to guarantee my contract for two years. And I play 60 games less than in the NBA. I said, you know what? I can go over there. I can work on my game and I can figure things out and I can come back. Was my thought. And I remember the first year, I remember the first three years. And I remember like the 13th and 14th year. I just went, everything just passed so quickly. So that's why um, I, didn't, I wasn't really, had I gone to a better team, I might have been tempted to stay, but I like to win. I like to play basketball, and I like to win. As And I'll do what I can to win, but I, I did not think I was that player that could turn a franchise team, a, a first-year franchise, into a winner. And actually, Dallas didn't win. They hadn't won 20 games when I retired. They won, they, they won 20 games, I think, four or five years after I retired from playing basketball. So I think I made a wide choice. <laughs> Good businessman. Uh, I, I'll wrap it up. I got one one memory that I have of you, and you may or may not remember, but um, I was involved with a youth basketball program in Baldwinsville, and we were having our banquet at the Moose Club. And my roommate, or one of my roommates, had been Augie Rotuno, who was an equipment manager up at SU. Yes, 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 yes. And I, I said, gee, it'd be nice if if you're running or any of the basketball players are hanging out, bring them out for dinner. And we were having, I, they just had spaghetti. It wasn't anything fancy. All of a sudden we're, we're about two thirds of the way through and we're getting ready to on, honor a kid. They had a foul shooting contest fundraiser. So you got sponsors and the kid that raised the most money got a free bicycle from the, the bikery here in town. So we're just about ready to call the kid up in the door walks Augie and behind him are these two monsters. Seven foot and six, nine, Roosevelt Bowie and Louis Orr in the Baldwinsville Moose Club at our booster banquet. And you guys walked up and people were speechless. They didn't know what, I mean, they were like, you know, 
two movie stars had just walked in the room. And so somewhere in my file of stuff, I have a picture of you standing with the kids by his bicycle and you guys are one on each side of them. And, and I saw the kid before he graduated from high school. He never was a basketball player. Wow. Uh, but he said, that was one of the best nights of my life. He said, you know, I was standing there with these two stars like I was a king. And I said, I had to remind you. Know, you I don't know if you probably remember. Gonna, you probably think it's funny. But I come from Kendall, New York. So small things stick in my mind. That's the only moose club that I ever went to. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. When we did it. <laughs> Well, it was a great yeah. night for us. Um, and I, I just, before Cindy wants to talk to you about some other things going on in your life, um, you know, I've, like I said, I've been a, almost a lifetime basketball fan of SU. I still, I've got my double final four when the men and the women both won a couple years ago. Yes. Um, you know, my wife knows it's SU basketball night. You know, I, I'm going to have my orange on and sitting there. Absolutely. And you're one of the guys that, that uh, just love to watch you play. The fact that you were so big, but you could run the court so well. I don't think I ever saw you act up to, to officials, you know, get it, you know, we had some guys over the years who made themselves the show and you just were, I, I would guess probably a great teammate. And uh, it's been a pleasure, a real honor for me to sit and talk with you this morning or this afternoon. It's a, uh, uh, I can tell people now I had a nice chat with Rosa yeah. Bowie. So it was my it was my pleasure. Thank you. And well, I would, we'd like to now now we'll fast forward a little bit to the current day, uh, Roosevelt. And uh, why don't you tell us now that you're back in the stage? You've been back in the stage. You're retired. Tell us what you're doing now. As far as we we talked at uh, when I first had met you. Sure. Like I said, I still have the crink in my neck from talking to you too, from looking up. And uh, you said you're involved with the youth and you're still involved with uh, Coach Beheim. So why don't you tell us what, what's going on there? Well, you know, my, my involvement with, uh, I've always had this thing for youth because somebody took time out, spent time with me when I was a young kid coming up, uh, whether it be um, out, uh, outdoor sports, outdoor activities. Uh, you know, I'm an avid fisherman, camper. I'm an out, I'm a country, I'm a country boy, so. Somebody took time with me, so I always felt that if I ever got a chance to come back, my way to give back, you can't become a professional player without a bunch of people following you. If you guys didn't care, didn't want to, want to, I, I weren't, weren't interested in following, I would still be, I'd have been Roosevelt, the pro fisherman, by, I don't know. <laughs> but it was, I got back, and uh, as far as basketball goes, you know, I, I only follow Syracuse University players. I don't follow any other teams. I came to Syracuse wanting to play, and I became a fan of Syracuse after I played there and after I left. So that I only follow people that I know and I like. So I've been following Syracuse, and that made me a, a huge, huge Syracuse fan. I mean, when if Syracuse doesn't go to the tournament, if people ask me who, who's my pick in the tournament, I tell them that the NCAA tournament was canceled. <laughs> that's just <laughs> the way. That's just the way I feel about it. And I don't watch another game until you know the next year. But um, to get back to it, so Coach Beheim would they, they would have these fantasy camps, and I would go back there, go back up to the um, to the uh, Carmelo Center, and for the main reason, we all all us guys, we we all get along so well together. So basically, we look at it as a way for us to all get back together, laugh, talk, eat, have fun, and then there's a fantasy camp in there in the middle. But it's just like the, the guys, it's kind of like they join in. It, it's a big family atmosphere up there. So that, that's what that's that's my donation back to the school. You know, I know a little bit. I don't know basketball, but I know the center position better than a lot of people on this planet. So any anything that I can interject or where I can help out, that's 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 my play. It, it's it, it, there's a there's a word in Italian dovere. It's my it's my um, uh, dovere translates to uh, uh, it's my mission. <laughs> if there's a Syracuse person who wants to know how to box out, block a shot, do anything. All, all they have to do is put their finger up and, I, and I, I'm there. So when they asked me to do the fantasy camp, I came to do it. But it's for working with kids. I've always felt the importance of working with children. Um, by leaving and going to Europe, I, I missed, I have four sisters. I missed, I would meet my, my nieces or nephews when they're two or three months old. 
And the next time I would see them, I'd answer the phone. I'd call home and they'd answer the phone before, <laughs> before I'd get back home. So I come home like, you know, 11 months later and they're like these little, these little people. And uh, <laughs> so I started, I started taking them to, to reconnect with them. I started taking them fishing. So I take them out fishing and within 10 minutes, I knew everything that they'd been doing for the whole year. Because once you catch your first fish, they don't just stand there and fish. They're just they're buzzing the whole time, telling me everything that they're doing and all the stuff, and things that happen between their cousins. So I, I'm caught up to everything within an hour. And I said, you know what? And they're so relaxed. They're, they're living in the city in Rochester now, but now they come back out to the country and they just like open up and, and they just want to be outside and learn how to do these things. I said, you know what? Fast forward, uh, then COVID hits and we're all inside. And I used to fish once once or twice a week um after COVID, when we got like when i could finally go outside i started fishing three or four days a week and the other thing that i noticed is i was so calm laid back and relaxed and my friends would come out to fish and they would go oh my god this was fantastic didn't catch a fish they didn't catch any fish but they're like this was fantastic i this is what i needed so i went back home and i put together a program i said you know what Every time I met uh, one of the salesmen for uh, one of the big um, hook manufacturing companies, and they said, listen, Roosevelt, everybody has great ideas. Nobody takes the time to put it down and make it in, put it into writing. So at that point, I came back and I locked myself away. So I started and I wrote down, I said, how would I, I want to teach kids how to fish. I want to, I want to give them something. There's a, there's a saying, give a man a fish and feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and feed him for a lifetime. But not only that, you create the experiences of a lifetime. So I went down there and we broke it down. I met up uh, with a, a professional fisherman, Guy Crump. We used to go out. He took me out fishing. We started talking about this because he was also teaching kids in, in, the, um, in, the, in the younger levels. So, so we came up with this program. So college, college course, 101, 201, 301, 401. So we start out fishing 101. It's called the Fishing Project. Fishing 101 is learn how to fish with live bait. Worms, crickets, whatever you want to use. Learn how to fish from the shore with live bait. 201 is for those that are a little squeamish, learn how to fish with the artificial bait that imitate the live bait. And that's also from the shore. And you teach them the ins and outs of that. Um, then 301 is Decide which one you like the best, whether it be live bait or artificial bait, fishing as a passenger on a boat. And you learn a little bit about reading the graphs. 401 is you actually learn how to launch the boat, drive the boat, read the graphs, and find the fish yourself. 501 full circle is you can either decide I want to become a professional fisherman, then you go down that path, or you want to become a mentor in our program. You can go back and start over there. And we're trying to work with groups of, we figured out it works out best with groups of 24, 25 individuals. We split them up into three groups. So it was 24, three groups of eight. We teach them about, about fishing, you know, the, the, the fish themselves, the, their, 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 their bait, it's a classroom study. Then one day we take them out and we take them out fishing. Uh, take them, we locate, first starts out we locate an older boat a 17 foot uh, aluminum boat deep v there is one behind everybody's house in every every quarter mile you go in the country there's somebody has a boat behind the house they haven't used in like 20 years they don't know what to do with it huh. so as it happened someone donated three of them to me so i said this is not a problem so during covid i went to youtube university and i figured out how to rehab take an ugly boat and make it into a beautiful boat so so with these 24 kids, and preferably they'll be affiliated with uh, some faith-based organization, preferably churches or the Boys and Girls Club YMCA, because um, we want we want principled children. We want to deal with. I don't. You don't want problem children. But at the end, you teach them how to fish, and at the end of the program, the boat that we all worked on to rehab and make all beautiful, um, I give to the program. So the boat that they worked on is the boat that they get because you can't teach a kid how to fish and then teach them how to fish from a boat and then take the boat away because it's, it's a setback. And I want to also show them that you can learn these skills 
about how to how to fix these boats, how to fix them up, and not only how to fix them up, but it's not that you don't have to spend eighty, ninety thousand dollars to buy a boat to enjoy fishing. You can find something that somebody doesn't even want. And the best thing about having a boat that was been sitting out in the fields for 80 years, it's made out of aluminum. Pretty much when you pull it in, it's still just aluminum. You can pull everything else out of it, put the floors back in it, put the seats back in it, and you spend very little compared to the enjoyment that you're going to be able to get out of it. And then at the end of this program, each program, we give those kids that boat. And that's the fishing project. And how long have you been doing this? Well, it's been in my head for about three years, but we're, it's putting it down on paper and getting it into uh, and starting a 501c3 foundation has been, we're, we're literally, we have our 501c3 um, uh, not for profit and yeah. by the end, by the end of this, by the end of this month, but it's, uh, I started, there's a Facebook page, the fishing project. If you go on there, I just started it. It's the fishing project. You'll see that there, it's just me and a bunch of people that I've taken out fishing and, and got them got them started uh, fishing. There's pictures, there's some pictures of there of Coach Bayheim. Coach Bayheim and I used to go out fishing once, uh, once a year. And then Buddy came along, Buddy liked to fish and the boat only holds three people. Coach Bayheim asked me, you got, a, you got a fishing guy we can go out with. So I said, yes, we go out with fish and then uh, a little while later, I'm getting pictures of Coach Beheim and Buddy catching fish with my fishing guide, and I'm not there <laughs> because it's a three-seater. So I was like, ah. so I had to go find another guide. And so now it's only my duty that uh, Coach Beheim, when he comes into his office uh, after I've had a great day fishing, I I take pictures, I send them to the, to the office, and I say, listen print this and slip it under the papers under coach behind that's just let the corner kind of hang out so <laughs> i leave them i leave them little surprises like that every time i catch a big fish so uh, that's great that's uh that's 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 a little thing so since buddy's buddy's off to his professional career i don't know maybe we might be able to get out again and start fishing again but uh he's uh he's a funny guy he signed uh he signed my you know we're, we're both from upstate new york he's from Lyons. i'm here from kendall so we pride ourselves in being fishermen right there was a uh, there was a caricature done of all of the of the all century team, and we all signed it to each other, so everybody got a copy of it, right? Coach Beheim signs mine, not by his picture. He signs it up on the on the matting. He signs it to the second best fisherman. I almost took the white out and painted it out. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> really? Like, okay, coach. <laughs> I was like, okay, that was a good one. That was a good one. Yeah. So that's that's what that's what made me start sending him pictures of my of my of my big fish. Or I would just I was like, listen, I called as like, girls, listen, print this out in real big, and then take it into the coach's desk and slip it under some papers. Just so the corners sticking out, so you'll see it when he walks in there. So that's my way to get back for him putting to the second best fisherman on my on my picture. I love it. That's funny. That's great. Well, anyways, I thank you so much. This has been such an honor for both of us. I was so excited to do this, and I wanted to include uh, my brother in because he's been such, you know, a sports fan and ball or a uh, basketball fan, SU fan, forever and ever and ever. So I wanted to include him, and I'm sure the interest will be great in this area because there's so many people that are just diehard SU fans and have been forever and they know you and you know they watched you develop and grow and and it's so good and I'm so glad that you could spend the time with us I'm glad that you you you're giving back to the kids because you had somebody help you and mentor you and that you're giving back as well and I certainly hope to see and hear more of you uh now it's called the fishing project on Facebook Okay, well, we'll encourage people to go and like that site as well. And then also, there's, uh, I do, I do also do Orange Appeal. It's Orange A P P E E L. Okay. And that's where we do. Uh, I'll do a post uh, uh, post game show where I'll do a recap during the week. I started it with Dale Shackelford, and and now uh, since technology has improved, I'm able to bring in other guests, other ex, other uh, other players. We'll talk about Syracuse basketball. So that's Orange. Appeal on Facebook Live, and it's Orange A P P 
E E L, Orange Appeal. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. But, anyways, again, thank you. This has been an honor. It's been a wonderful experience. And you've done you you've done so well with your life. You, you've, the, the path that you've taken is just a wonderful path. And you've contributed so much to those around you, the children, orange fans. And we hope to hear and see more of you in the future. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rosie. Well, thank you. You take care. Uh, that's up to my parents. They did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.